The of Yorkshire is the UK's largest shellfish fishery, a regional success story and essential to the local economy, employing fishermen on 66 local vessels and landing 30,000 tonnes of lobsters and crabs every year. Yet the recent Climate Change Commission report revealed that the UK's overall consumption emissions have increased by 10%, failing in their long-term goal to reduce our emissions. So how susceptible is one of our flagship industries to one of the main effects of climate change, ocean acidification? To answer this question, I will first be investigating what ocean acidification really is, how it is already making an impact on two critical marine systems, and the controversy surrounding some of the research current predictions are being based on. Dr Emerson is Chief Scientific Officer of the Sea Life Centre for Sustainability and will explain the chemistry of ocean acidification. Here at the Sea Life Centre for Sustainability, we monitor the ocean's pH and the trends over time. But to understand ocean acidification, we must first understand the processes behind it. In this first step, atmospheric carbon dioxide combines with the seawater to form carbonic acid. Hydrogen ions then go on to dissociate from this carbonic acid and decrease in the pH of the seawater. These hydrogen ions then go on to further combine with carbonate ions to form bicarbonate. This graph illustrates the trends in ocean pH over time, and as we can see, there is a sharp decrease in ocean pH from the 1800s onwards, from around 8.2 to 8.1 at present. This next graph shows a corresponding increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide, which suggests a strong link between atmospheric carbon dioxide and ocean acidification. And unless we do something to counter this, these trends are likely to continue into the future. Professor Pywell is based in Australia and is one of the world's leading experts on how the decreasing pH of the world's oceans is affecting coral reefs. Studying from Heron Island, she has observed a worrying trend. Coral reefs are complex, diverse habitats that are home to millions of different marine species, with many species using coral as a spawning ground for their young, or as a place to take refuge from predators. However, the decreasing pH levels of the ocean are posing a prominent threat to these important yet delicate ecosystems. Corals have a calcium carbonate skeleton, and decreased carbonate ion concentration in the water significantly reduces the coral's ability to produce this skeleton, affecting both individual corals and the ability of reefs to sustain a positive balance between reef building and reef erosion. The drop in pH also affects the symbiotic partnerships that corals have with certain microbes. A study by Webster et al. was undertaken exploring the sensitivity of microbes associated with coral reef biofilms. The communities were significantly different between pH 8.1, the ocean's current pH, and 7.9, the current projected ocean pH for the end of the century, with the trend continuing with the dropping pH levels. The high sensitivity of coral and its symbiotic relationship to biofilm microbes is a concern for reef ecosystems and highlights the need for vital research to evaluate the consequences of this microbial shift affecting coral health and reef structure. Unfortunately, coral reefs are not the only marine ecosystems under threat from ocean acidification. Dr Robin Scott from the Arctic Research Institute studies the effect of a decrease in pH on polar systems. Our research takes place primarily here in the Arctic Northeast Station with a particular focus on acidification, as in polar regions it's potentially more of a risk as the lower temperatures increase the absorption rate of CO2. Due to reasons too plentiful for me to discuss here, there is a decreased sea ice coverage, which of course means an increase in this rapid absorption to take place in these polar regions. Calcifying organisms like shellfish are affected by acidification, as well as important food web organisms like pteropods. Between the years of 2010 and the year 2011, the Canada Basin was found to be undersaturated with aragonite, which these organisms require for growth. Acidification can also cause acidosis, which occurs in invertebrates and sometimes fish, and leads to higher carbonic acid levels in bodily fluids, lowering blood pH. This negatively affects disease resistance, ability for physical activity and reproduction. Since the rate of acidification in polar seas is increased, regions such as this one could be used as a model to determine the effects that acidification has on marine food webs and biodiversity, if the effects are seen sooner here than in the rest of the world's oceans. Excuse me. As you have seen... Uh, sorry, excuse me. As you 
have seen. Ha, ha, excuse me. Uh. All right. Who are you? I'm Bernard, here to conduct an important interview with the chairman of Crust, the Crustacean Undersea Trust, to discuss the impacts of ocean acidification on their members. And you are in my light. Um, uh, right. Sorry. Bloody bipeds. Good afternoon, mammals. It's my great honour to have with us today the Honourable Gamorous, leader of the Crust Party, an elected member for the constituency of sub-literal Filey Brig. Here follows a party political broadcast on behalf of the Crust Party. Fossil fuel burning and deforestation have raised atmospheric carbon dioxide to levels higher than those of my forefathers 800,000 years ago, and future projections suggest rapid accumulation unless dramatic action is taken to curb human CO2 emissions. Our environment absorbs 30% of all your CO2, fundamentally altering the chemistry of our waters and shrinking the regions of our seas hospitable for calcium carbonate shells and skeletons. Our larvae face disruption to calcification and carapace mass and with only a 3% survival rate to adulthood they now contend with loss of competitive fitness and ability to settle. Yet some of your scientists profess there is little impact on our larvae but those laboratory experiments belie the reality of experience in the aquaverse. I see you are not persuaded. 20% of human protein is from marine resources. Ocean acidification's broader economic losses for the shellfish industry in the US alone would range to $6.4 billion by 2060. So, do something now before your commercially important fisheries are in tatters. Vote for those who will make policies to support ocean inhabitants. Support Crust today! Thank you, Your Honour. I have this testimony from Dr Barclay to explain the impacts of ocean acidification on the sensory perception of us ocean creatures. In the ocean, communication through non-visual means is crucial as light does not penetrate water to a great depth. Marine organisms often use chemical or auditory cues to avoid or detect predators or to locate prey or a mate. However, the phenomenon of ocean acidification poses a threat to these key processes. A pioneering study by visionary scientist and noted German Dr. Ralph Bublitz identified the sex pheromone uridine diphosphate in crab species Carcinus manus, which is released when a female is about to molt. Mating can only take place immediately after a molting when the carapace is soft. The effect of the attractant is so strong that when it is applied to a golf ball, a male crab will begin to guard it as though it were a mate. However, when the pH of the surrounding water is increased, the male crab can no longer detect the UDP and does not begin mate guarding behaviour. But it isn't just crab mating that could be affected by a decrease in ocean pH. Studies have shown that clownfish larvae lose their ability to detect predators and non-predators through smell under simulated ocean acidification conditions. Adult clownfish fare no better. A study by Dr. Simpson et al. showed that they lose their ability to detect auditory cues that predators may be nearby in acidified water. Anyway, as you have seen, even though the effects of ocean acidification are being felt throughout the world, the threat to the local fishing industry seems to be under debate. Yet the Honourable Member for Subliteral Filey Brig is anxious that positive action is taken and soon. How can there be two such divergent opinions? Dr Courtney Holstead will discuss the problems with making long-term widespread predictions based solely off laboratory data. The general public are placing a great deal of trust in the experts who tell us what's going on in the world of science and climate change. They believe their results, the accuracy of their models and the reliability of their data, and they have every reason to. The question I want to raise is, while I completely agree that these experts have indeed drawn some very useful conclusions on climate change, how much should we really worry about predictions made in the laboratory? The Earth's climate is a complex thing, with many different components that could be relative to each other in ways that we do not yet fully understand. Is it really easy enough to replicate this in a lab? Even if that can be truly achieved, how does anyone know, once any variables have been changed, that the results will be the same as they would in real life? So what I'm really trying to say is, next time we are shown a result of a scientific study on the future of climate change, 
We must take it with a pinch of salt and remember that this is only an estimation of what could happen and not necessarily what will happen. So, what is the future for the Yorkshire fisheries? The jury appears to still be out, but if the experience at our case study sites in other areas of the world are anything to go by, whilst initial effects in shellfish may be subtle, the long-term impacts in local waters are proving difficult to predict. React to auditory cues that a predator may be nearby when pe a different. No, for, sorry. <laughs> Marine organisms often use fish. No, they don't. <laughs> Why? 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 Why am I so shit? Coral reefs are complex, no, they're not often. And they decrease carbonate ion. Can't fuck. And decreased carbonate. I can't say that. Al. I just say that. The high sensitivity of coral. Fuck, I didn't to research to evaluate the consequences of this microbial shift affecting coral health and reef structure. This, this what shift? Microbial, microbial, microbial. Microbial. Oh fuck! <laughs> I'll just do the last <laughs> sentence again. I didn't think it sounded right. Microbial. <laughs> microbial. <laughs> microbial. It's micro. Fuck. <laughs> microbial. 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 <laughs> Sensitivity of coral and its symbiotic relationship to my. Yeah. <laughs> Get the fuck out. <laughs> we will make policies to support the ocean inhabitants. Support crust today. <laughs> Why is that there? <laughs> we monitor the oceanic. No. First, understand. Don't worry. We monitor ocean acidification, and that's not the words. <laughs> We're at the Sea Life Centre for fuck. <laughs> Research takes place here, primarily in the Arctic. No, fucking hell! Like that's <laughs> not find it. In this first step, can't. Oh, fuck's sake! Fucking hate doing stuff like this. Can we start now, please?